Wayne Duvenage, the founder and chief executive of Outer, joins us today with a question or to answer a question that many South Africans are now starting to worry about. And that is, is the 2024 election going to be free and fair? It's a watershed election here in South Africa, but there are signs that are rather concerning and Wayne will tell us why and give us his insights into how free and fair next year's election is likely to be given the circumstances that we currently have. Wayne, it's always good to have the opportunity to talk to you because you are an activist. Uh, Certainly, Outer is an activist organization that has huge support from the public. For those who have not come across Outer before, they might have heard of you from the toll roads days, uh, and clearly you stopped toll roads from coming into Gauteng. There was a heck of a lot wrong with that, as we have discussed many times in the past. But how are you being funded at the moment? How are you actually going forward? And indeed, how are you, what are you focusing your attention on? Thanks, Alec. Um, yeah, look, it's, it's quite an interesting story. But when we tackled the ETOL matter, and that started as far back as 2012, um, we, we needed to be funded by the public. It was the public's fight. And we initially were funded by business uh, when I was wearing a fleet uh, industry hat. Um, when we discovered the ETOL matter uh, was, was really wrong for this country that needed to be challenged in court. The court uh, gave us, opened the door with a good interdict, but then closed it because of technicalities. You know, the money had been borrowed, the roads had been built. Uh, but they opened the door slightly to say we could bring a collateral challenge if and when San Ross started summonsing people, and that's where it went. But what needed to happen was that this was going to be an even bigger fight uh, with hundreds of thousands of people uh, uh, potentially being summoned by San Ron. That's what they started, this lawfare strategy just to try and wear us down or wear the public down. Uh, And in 2015, 2016, started issuing lots of summonses. And the public, you know, we were about to close down. We'd done what we can on litigation, but the public were asking us to stay with this fight. And we said we would, and we're very keen to do so because there is a winnable fight here. Uh, and this is, uh, as I say, 2015, 2016, that we've been going for a couple of years. We could see it wasn't getting the compliance levels, but Sanral thought they could threaten the public. So what, what happened, long story short, is we said to the public, look, this is your fight. We'll fight it on your behalf. We can't do it without the funds. This is going to be very expensive. There's our bank account. We need to have debit orders. We need on, ongoing uh, revenue coming in. We need to employ legal specialists, investigators. Um, and as we started doing that, we could see the public's appetite to support civil society in a different way. Uh, and, and, and obviously, government had let, lent on business. They had run away. Uh, and the fight was really now in the people's lap. And we, that was our game, to support them. But the public were asking us to go broader. Can't we tackle at that stage? You know, uh, state capture was in full swing. Um, Zuma and, uh, and Dudumieni, and just it was headlines daily about what was going wrong. And so we said we would change our mandate and broaden it and tackle corruption, maladministration, irrational policies again on condition that the public stayed with us and kept kept funding us, even if the ETOL issue went away. It did go away 10 years later, last year, although they still haven't turned the system off, but it's pretty much dead. They've decided to fund it in the way we told them to do 10 years ago. Uh, And since then, since 2016, we've taken on another 250 projects, some short, some last a couple of weeks as we engage and get the right uh, uh, attitude uh, from government on, on issues that are questionable. Some take ages and cost millions of rands in court like the car power ships, like the recent decision on the, on the disaster for electricity uh, uh, declaration, or to some of these are really big and long-winded cases, but we stay the course and, uh, and we don't stop. We're fighting to ensure that, that, that we protect taxpayers' money from the abuse of power and corruption, and uh, it's a never-ending fight. We wish we had 145 staff, but we've got 45 dedicated, passionate, professional people who are activist mindsets but take their job seriously in the projects that we take on. And at any one stage, Alec, we've probably got about between 35 and 40 projects that are running. And as I said, we've opened 250-odd projects in the last seven years. It's been a lot of energy. What kind of person works for Outer? 
So <clears throat> they, um, they, they really are committed to making a difference. Uh, the structure is set up that um, we, 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 we save a lot on, on legal costs because our team builds affidavits and builds the cases quite quickly. And, um, and, and so we've got legal specialists, we've got advocate uh, on, on board, Stefani Fick, who heads up that accountability team, which also includes uh, uh, um, investigators. You have to investigate the information that whistleblowers bring us. Uh, we've got researchers there, and then we've got a good communications team. Our communications and media uh, liaison and, and, and the stuff that we put out to the media has to be well-written, has to be well-researched and, and properly presented. And then we've got back office, IT, uh, finance, HR. So, uh, yeah, a team of 45 people. We've got a little parliamentary office doing great work engaging with, uh, with MPs in the parliamentary space. And, uh, and we've got some local work that we're doing in the local government space, some, some innovative stuff there, uh, finding solutions and, and holding local government to account. A lot of work to be done there. Uh, and then the biggest thing that we did quite well successfully is, is as we saw, we had surplus funds at, at one stage. It's not always the case now because the times are tight. We built a litigation war chest because you need to have funds to go to court very quickly to interdict things like car power ships deals and deals that are grossly wrong for this country. You can't tell government, hold off on a decision while we're going to try and raise funds from the public. So our strategy in setting ourselves up for longevity has been has worked well. But as I said, uh, cash is tight and we, we, we need to watch our cash flow. So we need to get more people on board. Uh, it's, it's an interesting model. Sustainable because you have hundreds of thousands of South Africans who prepared to give you hundred bucks or so a month to fight against corruption. What I, I, what I was leading at and what kind of person comes and works at Arta is that not all the stuff you do is sexy. Yes, attacking someone like Dudu Mieni and winning that court case after many, many years uh, is uh, very much in the headlines. But what drew my attention to something that you've recently been busy with is the unsexy nature of something that's so very important. The Independent Electoral Commission is something that we all take for granted. It's funded by Parliament. It's going to ensure that we have free and fair elections and, and fine, all being well, excepting all is not being well on that side. And if they don't do their job and they're not properly funded, we won't have a free and fair election and then we won't have a democracy. So it's kind of this, this uh, digging into places that nobody else is really paying that much attention to that uh, I admire and I think many others do admire about Arta. But what is it about what's going on at the IEC right now that's worrying you and we should be worried about? Yeah, so, so in that space, Alec, what we do is we watch the – look at the financial reports that come out. We watch what's happening in the midterm budget policy statements and the budget sessions – and we look at the appropriation bills and, and try and see if there's concerning questions that arise out of this. We look at the trends, a lot of the state-owned entities, um, to see where their expenditure goes and why is there sudden changes in trends with Sanral, with the Department of Transport, the various little departments. You see these little empires being set up. And um, so on the IEC front, uh, look, we must first start out by saying that the IEC is, is, is a credible organization. It is well respected, um, and of course there are glitches in any elections. But overall, uh, the IEC runs a runs a good ship. But what worried us about this last bout of, of, of allocations is that we saw government reduce and tighten the budget uh, for the IEC. But at the same time, they granted the political parties an extra three hundred million rand. In the last financial year, they just slipped it in before the close of the financial year. So they took some surplus funds where they could, and IEC was one of those areas where budgets were tightened and cut. Um, and suddenly, we find the uh, political parties getting an extra 300 million rand and uh, allocated for this financial year as well and, and, and the following. Now, we all know that the ANC was broke, was battling to pay salaries. We know that out of their December conference, which went into January, that, that they decided they were going to approach Parliament to get more money for political parties. <laughs> and, and, and lo and behold, suddenly they get this 300 million rand. 
Uh, and, you know, we question, what is, is this our role that we should be funding political parties to this extent? We're not against the fact that the laws are there and they can get funds from, from, from the budgets. But what we've done is uncovered is a lot of money that goes to the political parties. And there's three streams of those uh, uh, that funding. And the first one comes from the IEC. The IEC allocates some of its funds uh, to, to the political parties, and it's obviously split up uh, get to the ratio of the last elections. Then Parliament does the same. And if you just add those two up, that's about uh, close to 700 uh, million rand. Uh, but the biggest issue is more than 42% or 52% of their finances come from the, the provincial budgets. So you have national that gives money to provincial government who's supposed to look after roads and schools and hospitals, and they start divvying out some of their money for, from the uh, provincial legislature to these political parties. And that's where most of their money comes from, and that's unregulated. It's a decision that the, uh, that the provinces make as to how much, and when you start unpacking that, Alec, you see crazy things like uh, you know, KwaZulu-Natal uh, spending uh, a massive amounts of money, uh, Gauteng spending the most when you compare that to the Western Cape. The Western Cape is, is a far lower percentage on, on political party spending than, than the ANC-heavy uh, um, electorates in, in, these, um, in, in, the, in the various provinces. I mean, uh, the, uh, the free state has an enormous amount of money that they put into uh, uh, 40 million rand a year, and they can't afford this. Uh, so so it's really worrying to see this sort of lack of control in the provincial side, a little bit more structured from parliament and from the IEC, and then these massive uh, budgets get increased while the IEC itself is running a very, very tight ship. And, and the one thing we know about next year's elections, different to all the prior elections, because for the first time, independent candidates will be standing. And this is where you've got to increase your budget for the IEC because they've got the onerous job of educating the public, uh, encouraging the public to get out there and participate in democracy. And if you look at the trends, they've gone from the 80% uh, percent turnout uh, in the first couple of elections right down to the last local election at about 46%. And just over fifty percent at the at the national elections in twenty nineteen, and that's not healthy for democracy. They've got a lot of work to get the people to understand why it's important to vote, why it's important to participate, to change the attitude of apathy, voter apathy, especially in the youth, uh, where around only fifty percent of people up to the age of twenty nine are uh, registered to vote. Uh, that's a big chunk. So the youth are you know, missing in action at the polls, and there's a lot of work to do, and there's a lot resting on the shoulders of the IEC, and we're questioning why are their budgets tightened while the political parties get a lot of money thrown at them. It's a really interesting subject, and given uh, that so little attention is paid to it, but how critical it is. We, uh, the point you made was that South Africans are going to the polls less and less. We're voting, le or less and less of them are voting, of us are voting, but it seems to be quite a profitable enterprise to be a political party nowadays because you get an allocation from the, the, the taxpayer. And that's quite, quite uh, concerning in the longer term because I guess it would also promote entrepreneurial politicians, i.e., let me go and start a political party because I'll live well uh, even though uh, just provided I get enough votes to be included in this pot and that pot seems to be growing, as you said, up by 300 million in the past year. In, in the report that you put out, you explained that that 300 million extra uh, compares uh, very favorably with what the money was that the political parties were getting in previous years, around about 150 million. Now, suddenly they're getting 600 million uh, in, from the national budget as one source of, of those streams that you're talking about. How was that justified? Because I was in the in the in the uh, lockup for the budget. I didn't see that three hundred million being slipped in. Yeah, it um, it was slipped in right at the end, Alec. Uh, um, the, just before the close of the financial year in March, in the budget speech in February, um, I think the Minister of Finance had heeded the call by the ANC, and uh, and it was just allocated. They have these prerogatives. 
Uh, they, 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 they look at the requests that are coming through from various departments. This is one that obviously came through uh, the Home Affairs, which is responsible for funding uh, political parties. And um, I don't think it was contested by the political parties. I don't think the DA would have contested to that because they would get their fair share of that extra 300 million rand. And so the political parties aren't going to turn that down. And this is where it, it comes to civil society to start asking these questions. Uh, we, we put in our concerns, but um, they weren't heeded. And, uh, and now we've got to start raising more concerns around how political parties are funded. You know, also the transparency around political party funding from our external donors. There's much to be said about that. There's still a lack of transparency. So, so much more needs to be done. Uh, but, you know, to be allocating a 1.7 billion rand a year of taxpayers' money to political parties to what? Manage themselves, market themselves again. We're not opposed to it, but it's gone up by so much. And uh, and yes, this next election, we've got to be very careful <clears throat> because one of the things, Alec, that is coming to the fore in the questions is it's going to be hotly contested. The ruling party looks like it's not going to get 50%. In fact, the research shows that the more people that participate in elections, the more that drop-off of the ruling party's uh, vote will be. In other words, if you can encourage people who used to vote for the ANC but are fed up with the ANC and not voting, uh, to go and vote for for something different. Now, that's the difficult challenge, but if you can get them to do that, the percentage of the ANC will, will, will drop even further. Now, if we can get that right, you go into coalition politics, and so what might happen in these elections, if it's close, if it's a close call and there's any integrity questions or doubt around the uh, integrity of the elections, then um, they're going to raise these issues that might turn into court cases, it might stay the, uh, the results, and that's when you start having a bit of a mess uh, that can develop. So it's critical that the integrity of the elections is not called into question, which is why we say the IEC for the first time in the, this election where things are changing needs to be given more money to do its work to ensure that there's integrity. On, on top of that, and we've uh, engaged with the IEC, we need to see more oversight from external entities. So ATA, in collaboration with other uh, organizations, are looking to put together a civil society oversight mechanism to have uh, observa observers in the polling stations, at the counting, uh, and they're not objecting to that, which is good. We have to have, obviously have to put this uh, forward to them and how we're going to do it using technology. So we're looking uh, in countries north of us where technology is being used in this regard in Africa, how it works, how it corroborates the IEC's numbers. Uh, and it's quite an exciting space to go into. But again, we, we would need funds to do this. Uh, and it adds to the integrity. And when civil society starts introducing oversight that corroborates and, and, and collates with the IEC's numbers, it starts to get over any hurdles of, of questions around the results. So we, that's new space for us, but we're going to have to do that in collaboration with uh, the uh, My Vote Counts and DDP, other civil society organizations that, that play well in this space. So from what I'm hearing, you are going to be doing everything possible to make sure and you being outer, that it is a free and fair election next year. But it's it's not just going to happen. Yeah, no, no. We will do what we can to do. Uh, um, we don't, and, and we, we do believe the IEC is going to do as much and as best they can with their funds. Um, we don't see a big threat coming uh, in, in that space. I think, again, as I said, the IEC is credible and they've got their teams but if you ask the IEC, and they've uh, made these comments in the in Parliament, that they would, they they need more funds. They need to do more in the space of encouraging people to turn out. They need to do more in the space of voter registration uh, and getting it out there for people to understand why they should register. The last thing you want is for somebody to be convinced to go and vote, and then oh gee, I didn't I didn't register. So it doesn't doesn't just happen on registration day or a few weeks leading up to it. It starts now. There's voter registration in November. There's voter registration in February again, we think. Um, and getting people to understand why it's important. Uh, IEC needs a lot more money than they have. 
uh, as does civil society in playing its role, because I think you're going to see now the political parties are going to be playing a massive marketing uh, and sometimes propaganda campaigns, and we have to refute some of the things that are going to be put out there. For instance, uh, you know, if you if you don't vote for the ANC, you might lose your grants. Uh, that's uh, that's that that would be propaganda that has to be fought on every front in all the official languages on every medium uh, to try and get uh, that notion or, or or that type of uh, information that might be false being fed out there. Uh, this, this this is going to be a very interesting election from that perspective. Wayne Duvenage is the founder and chief executive of Outer, and I'm Alec Hogg from biznews.com. 